this is a hard one. The current uh, thought regarding use of steroids versus uh, propranolol for hemangioma treatment and face syndrome. What's being used more often? So it's probably. So I, I think that's very individualized, and I think that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Um, particularly propranolol therapy um, in patients with face. And I think that um, we have a lot of um, discrepancy back and forth about when we should use it and when we shouldn't use it. I think the most important thing for you all to know about medical treatment is that it is individualized and I think it is it, it requires teamwork. So it requires looking at the MRI and talking to your um, neuroradiologist, talking to the dermatologist, to the people who are taking care of your child to make sure which treatment is the right option for the patient. Um, so I think that there is a, a general feeling that everyone is using propranolol for everything now, and I think a lot of people are, but I think the most important thing about when you use a drug, no matter in what kind of patient it is, that it has to be done in a very structured way with good close follow-up, and it needs to be a joint decision, especially when a lot of multidisciplinary people are involved, that that's the right choice for that patient. And we're going to try to come up with um, some more of a, of a risk stratification, um, but I think for now it really needs to be done at the individual centers with the child's best interest um, at heart making that decision. Okay. So kind of similar, but I'm going to direct this at Dr. Cromwell. Uh, are, are there um, specific safety concerns for use of propranolol? Um, in patients with cardiac disease, um, and then the second part with the arterial disease. <laughs> well, we use, in cardiology, we use propranolol quite a bit to treat irregular heartbeats, even in newborns and, and young infants. And, and we use it um, very successfully and safely um, in doses that are very similar to the doses that they're using to treat mangiomas. So, um, I think it's it's from a safety profile. I think it's a, it's a safe drug. Again, we use it in, in sometimes babies who have sick hearts, weakened hearts, or hearts that are beating irregularly, and those children in general tolerate it very well. We just we like to make sure that they tolerate it while we observe them. So we usually start it um, in the hospital um, just to watch the baby's reaction. But very honestly, very few babies have an adverse reaction. Uh, babies with face syndrome usually have a normal heart on the inside and have a normal heart rhythm. That hasn't been an issue. So I wouldn't be concerned about that. I do think that propranolol should not be started in any baby who they're worried about face syndrome until an echocardiogram is done because we have identified that a certain percentage will have a narrowing in the major artery to the body. The aorta, we call that coarcation of the aorta, and some of you may know about that. And so if you have blockage of blood flow to your body and you use a drug that kind of slows your heart down, um, can lower your blood pressure, that is uh, a time where I think propranolol could be more dangerous. Okay, and maybe one for you, Dr. Metri. Is there any um, connection known with um, treatment options, either steroid or propranolol, and some of the arterial changes that we see in face syndrome? Do you think there's, that the medications we use cause those changes? I think the answer is we just don't know. Um, I don't think that there's any evidence to date that propranolol does, and I think um, we just don't know the etiology of stroke. We just don't don't know what the reason is. It may be different reasons in different children, and we just we just don't know. I think. Um, with, with anything, you've got to weigh the risks and benefits of medicine for your child and, and um, just do the right thing. Also, you know, just a comment from, I think when you speak to doctors who deal with this all the time, they'll be candid with you that we, you know, we're at a limit of our knowledge and there's a certain amount of information we have and we're working on, but then there's the unknown factor and that's why I think it's so important to really get the help of all the people who have been involved in the care of your children. At our institution, when we do undertake propranolol in a child who has face syndrome, we've met 
families, we've spoken to the pediatric cardiologist, we've spoken with the pediatric neurologist, our interventional neuroradiologists at our institution is very helpful at looking this, at the MRAs and telling us if we think the circulation is adequate. But it really, it takes a lot of time and it's not a snap decision. It's usually one that's made over time and with the family involved throughout the, the process. I guess the other important thing, just because this has nothing to do with cancer, but I'm an oncologist, and what we tell our patients is that if you are uncomfortable at all, so during this process, if you have questions, it's really important for you to ask those questions and get them answered. Because when there's an area that we don't really know, we should be upfront and tell you that, and it should, again, be a group decision. But if you're feeling uncomfortable about it, we're not going to know unless you tell us. And I think that's really important to make sure that all of your questions, you ask them and they're answered appropriately so that you feel as comfortable as, as the people who are prescribing the drug do and giving you the medicine. Okay, um, so there's a, a couple surgical questions, Dr. Jensen. So uh, many children with face syndrome have involvement of their hemangioma on their lower lip, um, mostly entirely their, their lip, and uh, it's an area that I think is, is early care providers we see tends to leave a little more scarring, so sometimes all that's left is kind of a fuller lip. Um, and is there a, a certain timing of a surgical intervention that's better um, for the children? Um, the, does it heal better if we do it earlier, or is it less likely to have complications if we do it later? What's the thought process with the, when, when we do think there's surgical approach for lip debulking? I think that in, in those cases, it, it, it's, it's fairly individualized. It, a lot of it depends on the extent of scarring. My personal belief is, and I think there are a lot of people who believe this, is that um, very young children scar less vigorously in, in general. And that for that reason, a lot of people would advocate going and doing surgery earlier. If you, can, if you can recognize a need for surgery, then in general, going in earlier. It depends on how much scarring there is and what was the reason. Was it from you know spontaneous ulceration and involution? And, and if the scar is kind of immature, a lot of times when you operate on tissue that's still sort of inflamed, you get, uh, you have more uncontrolled scarring or, or less predictable scarring. So, so in general, I would say if you have a, a fairly stable scar, I would, I would prefer, I would recommend going earlier. Um, and, you know, you, you have to figure in, <laughs> you know, compliance and things. I mean, if you've got a two-year-old, you can't do uh, some sort of operation that's going to require them to keep their hands completely off of it for six weeks and expect it to work out. So you just sort of weigh everything. But in general, I'm in the camp that advocates going a little on the early side, as long as you can reasonably expect that, you know, eventually you're going to have to have surgery. If there's a chance that the natural course of things will give you a reasonable result, then I think it's, it's perfectly fine to just play it by ear. And this might be a little out of your area of expertise, but um, okay. the recommendation for surgical treatment of ptosis, so oh. I think there's probably two yeah. <laughs> ways to bit. get ptosis in face syndrome. It could probably have a nerve, you know, mm -hmm. a congenital nerve issue, but most of the kids have ptosis through the stretching, you know, of their, from their hemangioma and have fibro fatty tissue. Uh, and so, is there certain times that that would be better to fix timing of ptosis repair? That's a little bit out of my depth. I don't do ptosis surgery, but um, I, I expect it has to do with you know preventing amblyopia. And that mm -hmm. My guess is it, it's like everything else. The more severe it is, the earlier you have to be, or the more aggressive you have to be. And then there was a few questions about um, weaning propranol. So if you are um, on propranol, how we wean it, I think the, the question is always, uh, uh, are we weaning and watching for rebound growth of the hemangioma? But there's also some question about um, blood pressure and heart rate. So Dr. Frommel, do you want to answer what you might do if just concerning uh, heart rate and Sure. You know, I think that, that this class of drugs are called beta blockers are used very commonly in older adults, um, a lot for hypertension and for um, sick heart muscle, which is very different than the reason that 
we would use it in your children. And in those patients, if they suddenly stop taking the beta blocker because it, it tends to turn down the adrenaline level, that's how it works, their heart rate can shoot up and their blood pressure can shoot up to dangerous levels that can be um, hard on their hearts. We don't see that in infants and young children. In fact, when we use the drug for arrhythmias, um, we usually, we may let the child outgrow it, but we usually don't, don't even consider weaning it and really aren't concerned about rebound. Tachycardia means fast heartbeats or high blood pressure. It really, um, it has not been an issue at all in my experience. It really isn't even something that we, we spend a lot of time worrying or, or talking about. I don't think it's, it's wrong to wean it, but if your child misses a couple doses or if your doctor decides we've gotten the effect we want, we don't need it anymore, to just stop it in, in, in children is generally very safe. I think uh, we may break anything else for Did you get any questions from people that are here now? Okay. Can I just say a thing about immunizations? Because it yes. just, yes. just comes to home with, with oncology patients. So yes. when our oncology patients are on immunosuppressive agents, you still need to get yeah. the standard immunizations, okay? So, um, you know, the, the wonderful studies that Mike did and everything else, um, you, you just can't get the live immunizations. So, so please continue to give, you know, immunizations, and then what can happen is the titers can be checked later on. Because even in our patients that we really suppress their immune system, still there's there the majority of patients build up some immunity and it's worse for them to actually have one of those illnesses so you know rotavirus is a live vaccine chicken pox is a live vaccine mmr is a live vaccine um, and they all should get the flu shot as well so that's just important to right no i probably didn't make that clear that continue with the immunizations but keep in thought process that that we may need to check some of those and the only ones to avoid which your pediatrician should know, but, but most of us have a handout, you know, the, are the live uh, vaccinations. Um, but, you know, some protection is, is way better than nothing. And, and so it's really important, actually more important, to, to continue to get the immunization. And that's for only with prednisone, but for prenalol, yes. that's not. Yes, and only with the prednisone, right. um, and, and it may be the vincristine, but, but yeah. not. Yeah. The yeah. prenalol doesn't seem to have any effect on the mm -hmm. immune system. But certainly if there's airway issues and, you, you know, you're going into flu season and things like that, probably the flu is, vaccine is very important, for even for Pranola. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.